It seems self-apparent to me that at this point, discovering the various bubbles that we live in is very helpful in terms of coming to grips with what's going on in the country, how we can change what's going on in the country. You need to know what sort of media bubble you dwell in. And I've got some incredibly interesting information to, uh, to help analyze with you today, coming from an analysis of social media activity of Trump supporters and Clinton supporters over the course of the general election, coming from MIT. And what they did was they took um, tons and tons, it was well over 100 million people overall were involved in Twitter talking about the election. And uh, they were able to find out who was supporting Clinton, who was supporting Trump, and then map them out and look at the network of who they were communicating with on Twitter. And importantly, how much uh, overlap was there between people who agreed with them and people who didn't agree with them? Were they being exposed to information coming from people who believe very different uh, things about politics? And so we got two charts here. Let, let's look at this one. Absolutely beautiful data visualization here. And then you're seeing over on the left-hand side the visual mapping of Clinton supporters. On the right-hand side, uh, the Trump supporters. And what's interesting is that they differentiate between the two, saying that, uh, as you might expect, both tend to talk to people that they agree with, follow people they agree with, retweet people they agree with. There's a certain amount of cohesiveness. But it's not the same between the two, and they found that Trump supporters in general had less overlapping networks with people who disagree with them. Now that seems interesting because, of course, if you have any sort of social media activity like I do, you know that there's an endless string of people who seem to be big Trump supporters who are constantly messaging you, and I assume many of them follow me, which is very merciful of them, but they weren't necessarily engaging in a productive fashion with people who disagree with them. Clinton supporters had a bubble as well, but they tended to be um, a little bit more inclusive of different perspectives, and you're seeing that literally Literally mapped out there uh, by MIT from looking at literally millions and millions of tweets over the course of multiple uh, months. Uh, now they do point out though they have few mutual follower networks in common with the far right conservative cluster. And so even where there is uh, inclusivity it tends to be sort of uh, absorbing a little bit of the relative political middle uh, in social media and being exposed to a little bit people who aren't necessarily as firmly grounded in their uh, political beliefs. Now, before commentary on that, let's turn to the second data visualization, because super interesting. Here you're seeing a breakdown of uh, the people who talk mainly about one thing. So, issue areas that drive people's conversation. Which issue areas are the strongest there? You're seeing that guns are the strongest at 10%, basically, uh, right there. The exclusive focus of 10% of user groups. Uh, and then you're seeing that that can go all the way down to something like 3% or so uh, for education. And in fact, you see that on the bottom left-hand side, they tend to be very walled off from other things, the people who talk about that. But what's interesting is that considering what we, what we like to say is driving the followers of the various uh, candidates, and especially Trump followers, trying to understand what is it that drives a Trump follower, I mean, if it is purely about the economy... Well, it isn't duplicated, at least in their social media activity. And again, social media is not necessarily representative of jack shit, but that's the data that we have. And so 5% were driven uh, on the economy. Now, that is not just uh, Trump supporters, that's Clinton supporters as well. But you see that guns, 10% are driven exclusively by that. I don't even know if that's actually representative. It feels like guns are overrepresented on social media in terms of how passionate people are about them. And again, that can be pro-gun or anti-gun, although I'm going to assume it's probably a little bit more on the pro-gun side based on the tweets uh, that I'm getting. Racial issues uh, also, including immigration, which there's strong racial uh, connotations to that, and terrorism, uh, making up almost 9%, almost 9%, and over 8%. And that really shouldn't surprise us. There's a lot of race-based issue debate coming from either side uh, on Twitter. Now look, uh, how much can you draw from that? Well, first of all, you should go and look at the actual methodology because it's extremely interesting the way that they uh, try to tap into these conversations. And they did a really good job of following conversation threads to make sure that they were accurately mapping what people were really focused on and what they were driving towards uh, with their tweets. 
This is just one bit of information though. And uh, one of the themes that I've been talking about a lot and I'm gonna keep returning to is that you need to make yourself open and available to deferring uh, forms of information. Now, to the extent that you can do that on Twitter, that's fine. I don't think that Twitter is necessarily even the best place for it because people are incredibly freaking irrational on Twitter. But actual uh, sources of information, um, and that can come in the form of online magazines and newspapers, blogs, podcasts, uh, shows like the Young Turks channels, like my own, those sorts of things, you should make yourself available to those, and not just the ones that you already know you agree with. It's super easy to just listen to someone flap their yap when you know you already agree with what they say, but reading like complex uh, analyses of politics coming from perhaps journalists living in other countries, even people on the other side, so long as they are credible and reputable and aren't known to be just blatantly lying to you, you can enrich yourself by exposing yourself to that information, and not just to have a better understanding of politics and of reality, but it might make you more persuasive to people on the other side or those in the middle. And if you want to actually help change the national dialogue, that sort of training and persuasion, an understanding of uh, various points of view is incredibly important, perhaps now more than ever.